Hello, and welcome to another episode of In the Know, Slate's election talk show. I'm Julia Craven, your host this week. And today I'm thrilled to be talking to Maurice Mitchell, the National Director of the Working Families Party. If y'all have any questions for me and Maurice, drop them in the comment section. And welcome, Maurice. How are you doing today? Hi, Julia. I'm, I mean, I'm feeling actually really pumped. I've been preparing and training and organizing for uh, this moment for quite some time, and I feel no momentum. That's good. I like that. I like it when guests are, you know, feeling good in a good mood, feeling revved up. So let's let's just hop right into it. Tell us about the get out the vote efforts um, that the Working Families Party is doing right now. Right. Well, we have operations in a number of states and very, very significant operations in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin in particular, but also meaningful get out the vote efforts in, in Arizona, in Georgia, in Michigan, in Florida, and through our partnership with the Movement for Black Lives, which is called The Frontline, we've mobilized all of these folks who hit the streets during the summers, uh, during the summer, like the summer's activities uh, 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 around the deaths of George Floyd and Tony McDade and Breonna Taylor. And these folks are fired up. They're sending peer-to-peer -peer texts to folks all around the country to get out the vote. Uh, many of them, thousands of them are preparing to be election defenders, uh, where we're going to ensure that our people who are waiting in lines, sometimes for hours at a time, feel safe, have water, have masks and PPE. Um, and uh, so we feel that the our operation is as strong as it's ever been. There's a lot of grassroots momentum. Um, there's th literally thousands of volunteers who are participating in our GOTV operations. Week after week, uh, we're now sending half a million texts a week um, and growing. And so the, it's, it's just a massive operation that's taking place just with the Working Families Party, just our little corner of the movement. And you have to understand there are other independent organizations and volunteer organizations that are doing quite the same. So why is it important to just get people excited about voting, to, to send them information about it? Well, I think one of the reasons why in this particular moment it is so essential is because we're flooded by so much disinformation, right? Um, you know, if I could go on the internet right now and you know, I could find there's different genres of disinformation at this point, you know, targeted to particular groups. Um, there's efforts to confuse people about whether or not their ballots, if they mail them in, if they're legitimate, um, if they um, if the whole process of Election Day, if it's actually legitimate to be counting ballots after Election Day. There's all this all this confusing, all this confusion. So one of the things that we did even before this get out the vote um, sort of moment that we're in, we spend a lot of time doing voter education. You have to understand mm -hmm. that during COVID, so many people are mailing in their ballots for the first time or uh, doing early vote for the first time. And so for those first time early voters or, or those first time um, vote, voters at home, we wanna make sure that they get the right information that is accurate. And you know, this is not a surprise, but the far right is the culprit when it comes to this voter misinformation that they win when people are confused, uh, they win where people are cynical about the process. And so the the clear and accurate information does a, does a lot as a disinfectant so that the cynicism and the misinformation can find a home. Right, so how do voters combat this disinformation? Because when I was prepping for um, our chat, I found this story about two right-wingers in Michigan who were charged with voter intimidation um, voter intimidation, yes, after robocalls that falsely warned that the names of mail-in voters would be placed in a public database and used for arrest warrants and debt collection, which is just not true. So for people who see those stories or maybe for people who are just on the receiving end of this disinformation and they don't necessarily have access to voter education, how, how can they go about um, pre-prepared voter education? How can they go about educating themselves? Yeah, that's a great question. So much of our organizing is really ultimately designed to do that. So mm -hmm. the more educated you are, and when you're a part of an organization, and, and at this point in any local community, there's so many grassroots organizations. Some of them are nonpartisan uh, organizations that have accurate information and 
create a space for people to come together in their community so that they know how to vote. Uh, some of them, like our organizations, are fighting organizations that, that have a very particular political point of view. But all of our organizations create spaces that um, sort of protect our folks from the misinformation. When you have the accurate information, when you feel safe, when you feel um, educated as a voter, Hey. <laughs> Hi. I am not quite sure what happened. Um, but <laughs> the last thing that I heard you saying, I assume the last thing our viewers heard was you were saying that educated voters are empowered. That's right. Okay, let's take it from there. And I'm not exactly sure what happened there. But yeah, uh, if you're an educated voter, then you're able to perceive more easily what's what seems like misinformation and what clearly seems like the truth. The other mm -hmm. thing is as you become more educated, you begin to develop the muscle of just being able to recognize that all, all information from all sources should not be credible. And it's, 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 it makes sense to discern. So simply because you see a meme from somewhere doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's legit, right? And so a lot of our organizing does that. Also, like, you know, those, those half, a, half a million texts that we're sending, we're providing voter information to people, right? So we're, we're providing information on their polling location, information on any deadlines that they might have directly to, to voters. We're sending mail out with that information. Um, but the misinformation, I think, we saw that in 2016, it's only intensified from both actors in this country and foreign actors. It could be a lot of noise. It could be very confusing for your average voter to know what's what, and it's racialized, right? So the message that you just talked about, um, you know, clearly that message had some like racial undertones. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure if you pulled the, the list of folks that they were sending those robocalls to, it was probably tailored to the voters that they thought would not be their voters. And your racial background is, is one of the main determinants of how you're going to vote, right? Like we know that black folks tend to vote for, for, uh, Democrats and, uh, white Christian evangelicals tend to vote for Republicans, when you know the information, you could put together a list of people who you think might vote a certain way and try to depress their vote. It's unfortunate, but that's what's taking place right now. Right. And so what are your thoughts on voting being so confusing? Because I find myself fielding questions from people and I think they think that because I'm a reporter, I'm not also confused. Um, and I'm just like, I'm I'm a bit less confused than you are probably, but it's still pretty confusing to figure out voting, um, particularly when, like me, you were born and raised in North Carolina and you had to get off the voter rolls there so that you could get on the voter rolls where you live now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, our country, one of the things I, I wanna say about voting in 2020, right, is like, if you're confused, you shouldn't feel any type of way about it, right? <laughs> so the, number one, our country's um, system of elections, there isn't one federal system of elections. Mm -hmm. There is a patchwork there. You know, each state uh, essentially has its own election laws and administers its elections state by state. But then each county has its own election officials and administers county by county 
It's elections. Right. So it's this, it's this vast patchwork of thousands of jurisdictions. So if you, if you move from one county to, to, to the other, you might ha- be subject to sort of different rules. If you move from one state to, the, to, the, uh, to another, certainly you're subject to different rules. So, you know, don't be insecure about the fact that, that, that this is complicated. It's by design, unfortunately. And then the second thing is we're voting during a historic pandemic. And it's so many of these states, this is the first time where people are, are voting early or voting at home. This is new to a lot of people. And so I tell people, don't be insecure if it's a little confusing. It's by design. And absolutely, at the other end of this election, uh, God willing, when we defeat Donald Trump, one of the first orders of business that our Congress and our state legislatures should be involved in is dramatic structural democracy reform so that our system of voting is, um, is easy and accessible to everyday people. And there aren't barriers to the franchise. Um, you know, and there's so many barriers, there's so many anti-democratic barriers to the franchise from uh, political and racial gerrymandering, uh, where elected officials are basically choosing their vote, their voters. And I can't think of a more anti-democratic practice, but it's legal now and it happens in a lot of places, uh, mm-hmm. to voter ID laws, which are designed so that Republicans and people on the far right can ensure that, that voters who they think won't vote their way won't vote, won't vote at all. Um, and all of these various either suppressive or uh, uh, tactics to depress the vote, we, we could do a lot politically to change that. We need to have the political will. And I'm hoping that on the other side of this election, that's one of the first orders of business of Congress and then state legislatures. Got you. And so just to talk a little bit more about barriers to voting, this year there are a lot of concerns about voter intimidation. Um, because the consent decree that barred the GOP from intimidating voters was, it ran out in 2018 and it wasn't renewed. So I wanted to ask you, what is voter intimidation? And when the people who are working with the Working Families Party are at the polls, what types of things are they looking for? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. And I wanna be really clear about this. Um, Voter intimidation would not exist if we weren't powerful and if we weren't winning, and if uh, folks on the far right felt that they could pass their laws and get their uh, elected officials through, through democratic means, right? So the the good side of it is like, these are the tactics of people who understand that their policies and their program are on the losing side of history. So they desperately are doing everything they can in order to cling to power. And so um, if it's this election or next election or the election after that, the, the, their type of politics, uh, the days are numbered for their types of politics that sort of focus on white Christian identity, on, on deep racial grievance, on cynicism, on despair. But to, to more specifically answer your question, um, we've actually developed a project and it's, um, it's a joint project between us and the Movement for Black Lives and many others. It's a it's a nonpartisan sister project of all the work that we do in the field called uh, the Frontline Election Defenders, as well mm-hmm. as Joint to the Polls. And what we've done is we've trained thousands of people all across the country to show up and inspire folks so that they don't feel intimidated, right? And, and we're not even focusing on the voter intimidation tactics, which may or may not come. We're focusing on the voter to ensure that the voter has a safe, and joyful and empowered experience as they wait maybe for hours on the line. Um, and we'll have people handing out water, handing out masks, um, encouraging people, we'll play music. And we've even uh, enlisted artists and musicians to perform. So uh, there'll be artists and musicians tomorrow in more than a hundred places performing for voters uh, all across the country so that they feel inspired. And that environment of joy and connectedness is actually one of our strategies to prevent voter intimidation. It's a lot harder if you are a troublemaker to create an environment of intimidation when there's a joyous hip hop concert where people are connected uh, and people are, are enjoying themselves on, online. Uh, there was a viral video of one of our actions in Philly where folks were dancing to the cha-cha slide. It took off. I think people just wanted to see some positive news. Um, but all those things, and it was actually the same day when 
in another county in Philly, um, some far right MAGA folks tried to um, intimidate people and slow them down so that they couldn't vote. Those, vo those folks stayed and voted. Uh, so I think the, um, the good news is that our folks are resolute. Uh, our folks did not come here to play, they came here to vote. Um, and we have thousands, like a, a armada of thousands of people who are gonna ensure that that happens in a safe way. And uh, people who are trained to, to be able to pick up on when things aren't going well and when we could just like draw down some of that energy and, 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 and sort of dial up the joy and happiness. Um, so we're gonna be focusing on that to ensure that not only are we de-escalating, but we're actually like, like escalating the joy, right? I think that that's sort of the strategy that we're gonna employ. Right. That's very true that voters are, black voters especially are resolute because one thing about black folks, they gonna vote. Oh, we gonna vote. And <laughs> if we sense that somebody is trying to plot to get in between us and the, that just, that motivates us even further. Like, don't tell us right. we can't do something. It fuels the, like the ancestors start to rise up in you a little bit. And it's just like. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, so just to go off of that, um, how can people like, if by chance someone does end up in a situation where they are being intimidated by someone, how can people go about diffusing those situations themselves since not every election place is going to have an election protection unit there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, don't don't get baited into the confrontation. Keep your eyes on the prize. You came here to vote. Um, in any polling place, there's um, there's um, electoral officials. Definitely um, alert them to anything that's irregular, um, and they they're trained to deal with irregularities. You as a voter should not feel like it's your time to directly intervene in anything. You came yeah. here. For a very particular mission, and you know there will be trolls in certain voting places. You know we heard the president um, during one of the debates call for his supporters to look very closely um, at polling places in places like Philadelphia, where bad things happen. We know what that's code for. So we should right. intimidate, like we should intimidate some of those tactics. And I, I, for one, you know I think we should take all threats seriously, but they win when we become alarmist they win when we become fearful they win when we become when we become cynical and part of the efforts that uh the president was involved in on that for in that first debate was to create an atmosphere of fear so when he says my people are going to be looking very closely that was a voter depression technique so that mm -hmm. some percentage of the audience would think oh there's probably going to be some like far right MAGA people there, they might be dangerous, maybe I won't go, right? So they win when um, we cede that space to them and just suggest like, yeah, tomorrow's gonna be chaotic and there's gonna be a lot lot of disruptions. I, um, I am hoping that their activities will be a whimper and um, juxtaposed against our, our efforts and the momentum that I'm feeling, but the story is going to be this triumphant wave of people who are resolute and decided that it was time for them to seize their democracy. Not these sort of like QAnon folks who are running around um, and trying to cause prob uh, problems. I, and I think they're gonna be a footnote um, when the story is, is, is all said and done. And what will be the larger story is the tens of millions of people who already voted. Like in certain states, more people already voted before election day than voted in, in its entirety in 2016. That's just remarkable. So um, I'm focusing on that energy. Fair enough. And so I also wanted to ask you, so me and you, I interviewed you last week for a story. Yes, that's right. And I am bringing this up because I think it's relevant to this conversation. Um, I explained to you how, like when I'm sitting here with all of this information about voter disinformation and intimidation, like what really goes through my head is why people do this. Um, and my initial thought is, well, they do this because they're racist, but you took it beyond that. So I just wanted you to share that with the voters because I thought it was just very poignant, like what you said. 
Yeah. So the the racism is real, and that absolutely is a is a driving force. But you know, if you take a few steps back and you try to make sense of all of this activity, it comes down to one thing: power. It, the 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 far right in this country um, is interested in both maintaining the power that it has, weakening the power of people that they think are their opponents and changing the structures of our democracy and our economy so that the already powerful of them could have, have even, even more power, right? So when you, when you look at it in that way, it begins to make more sense. So the, the Republican Party, uh, the Republican Party under Trump has decided to double down on the most virulent, open sort of uh, appeal to white Christian identity politics, white grievance politics, and therefore has cut itself off from being able to organize any significant percentage of people of color and is basically banking on, on blowing it out and having huge majorities of white folks vote in the direction of white grievance. And the reality is demographically that just looking at the numbers, there is a cliff, there is an end to white grievance politics if you live in a democracy. Right, so that's a big if. So if you are aligning with white grievance politics as your electoral formula to maintain power, then you progress in a country that's becoming more and more brown and more and more black, you progressively need to commit yourself to anti-democratic measures, to, voters, to voter intimidation, to, to suppressive and depressive techniques in order to maintain electoral majorities to keep power. And so I look at I look at apartheid era South Africa. So the white ruling um, minority called whatever that was a form of democracy, right? And so right. for folks who want an example, they were, you know, they, they considered what they had a for, form of democracy. People voted and a very, very small minority of people maintained all the power, which you will see if the Republican Party continues to double down, and I think it's gonna be really hard for them to shake this off, they will begin to open, they already have, openly question democracy itself. So they're right. sitting senators that are openly questioning democracy itself. And this is part of, this isn't Trump, this is part of a four decade uh, commitment uh, by very, very radical sort of arch conservatives that actually believe that the ability for everyday people to organize their votes together and to vote for measures that might have uh, wealthy people pay more ta ta taxes, for example, or uh, come together and organize as uh, their labor through labor unions, they believe that that is tyranny. That is, like mo that is like mob rule. And what they need to do is to advance an agenda and ideology that fights against that tyranny so that they already wealthy people in their corporations could do anything that they want to do, um, irrespective of the popular will. So they look at, they look at us coming together and voting uh, against corporate rule as being a true mark of tyranny. Uh, so folks like the Koch brothers and others have spent billions of dollars over four decades to get to this point. So this is the final stage of a, of a plan that they've been committed to for, for decades. And so when, you, when we understand that, then we're not surprised that they're using all, type of, all types of uh, racist tactics because they, they know that a majority of black folks consistently election after election vote for Democrats. So they don't really need to know very much about black folks or black communities if they know that they vote for Democrats, like 80 to 90%, depending on the election, we need to ensure that they don't vote, period. And we need to do everything in our power to, to create various types of barriers to them voting or to a working class and poor people voting or to Latinx folks uh, voting or immigrants naturalizing. All of this is to maintain white majorities and, uh, and to maintain um, um, white, ma uh, white majorities to advantage corporate power and the power of very, very wealthy people. Right. It's all very insidious once you step back and look at it. Um, and so my last question for you is, it's a big one. Um, okay. I hope, I hope you've thought about it. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think historians will discuss 2020? It's a great question. 
I think that 2020, the 2020 election will be a referendum on black lives, either way, in either direction. It, it'll, it'll be a proof point on the direction that this country wants to go uh, in relationship to this reckoning on, on black folks and racial justice. Number two, this was a moment of, you know, it's almost become cliche, a moment of intersecting crises, right? And so from the climate crisis to COVID-19 to the economic crisis that came as a secondary impact of COVID-19, uh, you know, to this racial justice crisis that, that we experienced. And crises demand resolution. And crises like this uh, demand a country really engage in some introspection. And so this is gonna be a turning point for this country either way. Either we're gonna double down on the white Christian identity, sort of cynicism and uh, racial grievance and go full bore into that. Right. We will, the, the, and there's two more choices. We'll try to go back to normal, right? And you'll see people directly after this election, if Biden is the victor, go back to brunch, right? Or the, there's a third direction, and this is the direction that I'm most excited about, where we spring forward, where we understand that going back to normal is basically recommitting to the, to the conditions that led us here. Uh, committing to Trump is going even further into the dystopian sort of reality that Trump and his, his uh, cohorts would want us to go into. But there's a, a third option of going forward and, and becoming an America that we've never actually realized. Uh, and transforming our democracy and our economy in a way that actually works for everyday people. And being accountable to this multiracial working class alignment of folks who would have set up an electoral mandate for that to happen. Right. We definitely are gonna have to have quite an imagination moving forward. Um, Indeed. But <laughs> but that's our time. And I thank you so, so much for being a terrific guest. And thank you to everyone at home for watching. Come back next Monday when my colleagues, Mark Joseph Stern um, and Dahlia Lifwick will be discussing any legal challenges resulting from the election. This show is produced by Faith Smith and Britt Pulley. And from all of us at Slate, take care, go vote and wear sunscreen, please. Good idea. <laughs>